This is my first time speaking to you. I hope that it will be of some use and that we might be able to meet once a week on Tuesday evenings to read very slowly the Gospel of St. Mark. I, for those who don't know me, and I think it's the vast majority of those who are watching, am a South African who at a very young age moved to Jerusalem, and I have been there for more than 40 years, a lot of that time as a Jesuit, and for the last 23 years have been teaching scripture in the diocesan seminary and in other frameworks in the Holy Land. So once again, I'm very happy to be with you. We will be studying together the Gospel of St. Mark, and some might be asking why St. Mark when we are in the year of St. Matthew. So a few reasons. Number one, we will next year be in the year of St. Mark, and so we are preempting, preparing for next year. Number two, according to most exegetes, and I agree fully with them, St. Mark is the first gospel that was written. And St. Matthew and St. Luke are firmly relying on the writing of St. Mark. Third reason, St. Mark is the shortest of the books of the gospel. And so perhaps we'll be able to get through a good piece of St. Mark uh, during the course of this year. And finally, the last reason, and now you'll guess it's the most important reason, I simply am in love with St. Mark. So <laughs> what we're going to do, we will be studying very slowly the text, reading it very slowly with the help of a PowerPoint. So I will be turning on a PowerPoint each time so that you can follow. Hopefully you have a Bible next to you for those who'd like to compare. I'm using the new revised standard version translation. I think it's pretty decent. Sometime we'll be making reference to words in strange languages like Greek predominantly and sometimes even Hebrew or Aramaic. Um, the structure of our hour together will be each time we will start with a time of prayer. I have chosen a chant of Teze, which you will be able hopefully to hear well I, wherever you are. Then we will have a presentation that will take us for about 45 minutes, and then we will have a time for discussion, question and answer. Now, I did not expect so many people. So I do ask that when you have a question, you write it in the chat because we will not be able to see everyone and I don't want to skip anyone. So simply when you have a question, whenever it arises, simply write it in the chat. And then during the time of discussion, we will be able to open the chat and see what the questions are and hopefully respond to them or together search for answers. So I'm going to begin now by opening a screen. I am a technological disaster, so please be patient as I try to share screen with you. Good, I'm hoping that now you see me. Uh, you know that you don't see me. I hope you don't see me. I hope you see the PowerPoint presentation. And as you can see, the Jesuit Institute, yes, that's where I am. And we are reading the Gospel of Mark again. And that's me, Father David. We start with a time of prayer. 
And so let's get to work. I'm going to give a few introductory comments. We will not spend a long time on who wrote this text, for whom, when, where, and why. We might be able to discuss that in more depth once we've finished reading this wonderful work, but the points I want to make are the following, and I will make them very briefly. We are going to be reading a late first century text in the Greek language. You see there an icon of Mark and under it, one of the most ancient manuscripts of the biblical text that we have, an ancient codex from the fourth or fifth century. And what you see there, I'm sure many of you will be able to read it, is the beginning of the Gospel of St. Mark. Notice something very interesting. The letters flow without any separation between words, no punctuation. And so a lot of interpretation goes into breaking up these letters into words and adding punctuation. So a late first century text in Greek. Second point, very important, and I will be underlining it at every moment. This writing is based firmly on the sacred scriptures of Israel, what we Christians call the Old Testament. Without knowledge of the Old Testament, the text hardly makes sense, which means that the writer is someone who knows well the scriptures of Israel, most probably, almost certainly, a Jewish believer in Jesus. Third, the writer writes very carefully. This is not a hastily written document. This is a document in which the writer has chosen words very carefully. And this level of literal understanding of the words will be very important as we go very slowly through the text. Fourth point, this is a work of literature. This is a masterful writer, someone who knows how to tell a story, someone who knows how to weave the intrigue that he is laying out before us. But not only a work of literature, but a work of deep spirituality in which he is giving witness to his faith. By the way, I keep on saying he. Well, we don't know for 100% that the author is a man. Nowhere is the author's name given. The name Mark was given to this gospel only at the end of the second century. And finally, it is indeed a work of theology. What does theology mean? It means talking about God. Yes, he is offering us a language, a language firmly based on the language of the people of Israel in the Old Testament to talk about God and to talk about God and God's Messiah and us the people who are listening, the people who want to follow that Messiah. And finally, undoubtedly, there are elements of history in this story. This is not a fantasy. Jesus, the incarnate man who lived in the first part of the first century, is being documented here. We are not going to get into the very prickly subject of how much history is this. The next point. Let's remember that most exegetes believe that this is the first of the books of the gospel. I share with you something very personal. I have a terrible allergy. I break out in a rash when I hear the word gospel in the plural. There is no such thing. The gospel is one, unique, and it is the good news of the resurrection and Christ is resurrected. We have four books in the New Testament that tell the story of that good news, but only one gospel. Now, two more points which will be guiding us in our reading. First of all, Mark is not the first to write Jesus. Jesus the preacher became Jesus the preached one after he was resurrected. His disciples become apostles, went out to preach the good news of the resurrection. We have little trace of Jesus the preacher and little trace of the oral preaching that preceded the writing of Jesus, Jesus the written one. And the first one to write Jesus was Paul. 
beginning in around the year 5051, a short time, just 20 years or less after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, Paul began writing Jesus. The first writing that we have in the New Testament, as I'm sure most of you know, is the first epistle to the Thessalonians. I believe, and this is controversial and not many accept what I'm about to say, but I believe that Mark is a disciple of Paul, that he in fact is offering us a narrative that conforms to Pauline theology, and I will point that out sometimes. And finally, Mark is, and this is accepted by most exegetes, the basis for the gospel according to St. Matthew and the gospel according to St. Luke. Matthew includes about 90% of the Markan material, adding a lot more. Luke includes about 40% of the Markan material and adds a lot more. A big debate, did John also know Mark? I believe that he did, but that's a subject for another day. And now we're going to plunge into this wonderful text. The text is a very structured text, and as we walk through it, I will develop this slide. I'm not sure we're going to get far beyond the title tonight. If we do, we will do the next two verses in chapter one. Slowly but surely, you will see the deployment of the structure which is integral to this wonderful work of the man or woman we call Mark. So we begin our reading. Every word carefully chosen. And I will add that most exegetes believe that this is in fact the title of the work. As the author writes, the beginning of the good news of Jesus, Christ, Son of God. In fact, the article at the beginning is not in the Greek for those many of you, I'm sure, who can read the Greek. It simply says, beginning of the good news of the euangelion, the evangile in French, taken from the Greek, euangelion, of Jesus, who is the Christ, who is the Son of God. What I'd like to do is look carefully at each of these words. Each of these words evokes a universe. And I'm not going to be going into such great detail that many of you will fall asleep. But I do think it's important as we get started in our study of this text to take very seriously, and again, I repeat, the choice of words. There are few words in the Gospel of Mark that do not have echoes in the Old Testament. And this is what I'd now like to point out. Let's look first at that word beginning. And I'm sure that with me, you immediately think of the beginning of the Old Testament. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth. The beginning of the good news. By the way, please notice something that I will also underline as we advance in our study, that the title of this book is not gospel, but beginning of the gospel. And that is very significant in this work. We'll understand that as we move along in our study. But again, the echo is very clearly with the beginning of the creation. We are entering now into the good news of a new creation. Paul compared Adam with Jesus, the first Adam and the second Adam. So again, a new creation. Beginning appears many times in the Bible, but I've chosen one more verse from the Old Testament. In fact, a text that strongly influenced the Gospel of John, and that is Proverbs chapter 8, a wonderful text that I strongly recommend you reflect on, 8.22 to 31. But the text begins, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. This is a wisdom text 
that talks about actually wisdom. Wisdom being created as the first created being that accompanies the creation of the world. And so we see here an echo already with the Gospel of St. John that begins, in the beginning was the word. So again, this word arche in Greek, ah, reshit in Hebrew, Genesis, the beginning. And here in the Gospel, according to St. Mark, we have a new beginning. And it's the beginning of what? It's the beginning of good news. And again, I stress good news. What is the good news? This concept of good news is based very strongly on the book of Isaiah. Because in the center of the book of Isaiah is the incredible good news. I'll say in a moment what that good news is, but let us read three wonderful texts that I'm sure we know from the book of Isaiah that talks about good news. And here, a little note. Sometimes our translations don't help us when the words that are used by Mark in Mark's writing are found in the Old Testament, but when we look for them, we don't find them because other words have been chosen. I'm going to revert to the word and translate it the same way in the New Testament and the Old so that we can see these wonderful echoes. And so here we have it, the three verses. First of all, Isaiah 40, verse 9. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news, who heralds good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Those of you who know Handel's Messiah, yes, it begins with console, console my people. And it reaches a peak in this scene. I want to lay it out for you so that you can understand a little more. What is the good news that Isaiah is proclaiming? The good news is the following. Console, console my people. You think that you are dead. You are in a tomb, the tomb of exile in Babylon. Yes, for your sins, I warned you, for your sins you have died and are in the tomb. But now comes the moment of consolation, for God will not accept death as the last word. God is faithful even when we are not faithful. And as the voice calls out to prepare a way in the wilderness, another voice goes to destroyed Jerusalem, far away from Babylon, saying to Jerusalem, Zion is another word for Jerusalem, so we have it twice, get you up Jerusalem to a high mountain, Lift up your voice with strength, Jerusalem. Those of you who have been to Jerusalem will remember that on the east side of Jerusalem is the high mountain. It's called the Mount of Olives. And Jerusalem is called to go up on the Mount of Olives and look to the east. And if we look to the east from Jerusalem, we are looking in the direction of Babylon. Lift up your voice with strength. Do not fear. And then comes this incredible proclamation. Say to the cities of Judah, this is the good news. Here is your God. Now, of course, what Jerusalem sees is the resurrection of the captive people, the exiled people coming out of the tomb and coming back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city. But they say something striking, saying, here is your God. Not here is resurrected Israel, but here is your God. Because they recognize that the life in Israel who died and was buried, the life of Israel is now God. This is the good news. The conquest of death 
death is vanquished. Please note, that's the center of the Old Testament, the experience that Israel has of resurrection, a return from exile. For an exiled people is dead, and death is the end of the story. But here the story continues because God is faithful. Let's read another verse. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the one who heralds good news, who announces peace, who heralds good news of good, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Yes, the proclamation is sin that you have chosen does not reign, for God will not allow sin to be the last word. And finally, again, a text we know very well. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has appointed me to herald good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. Many of you will say, oh, we know that verse, but we know it from the Gospel of Luke because indeed, in that inaugural scene where Jesus reads from the scroll in the synagogue in Nazareth, he reads this text. But again, its original context is the return. The return, which is a resurrection of a people exiled, a people dead, who ri rises from the dead to return to the land of the living, to reconstruct Jerusalem and begin again the adventure of living in the kingdom of God. So good news, the beginning of good news, words that evoke a whole history of salvation. Let's continue. It's good news of Jesus. Please notice, I'm sure that you've studied this and know, knew this before, but Jesus, this is not the first Jesus we've come across in the history of salvation. I've written there his name in Greek, Jesus, from where we get the word Jesus. But I've also written his name in Hebrew, Yeshua. Yeshua is an abbreviate, abbreviated form in Hebrew of Joshua. Yes, Jesus' Hebrew name is Joshua. And let's remember now who Joshua is. Joshua is the successor of Moses at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. The people are still in the wilderness. Forty years have passed and Moses will die in the wilderness. But Moses, before his death, in a wonderful text in Numbers 27, ordains Joshua to be his successor. And of course, what Mark saw there is he ordains Jesus to be his successor. And where are they? They are on the banks of the Jordan. And it is Joshua, Jesus in Greek, who will lead the people across the Jordan River into the kingdom of God, into the land of promise. The parallelism between Jesus and Joshua is absolutely foundational to the Gospel of Mark. We miss a whole level of the Gospel of Mark if we don't constantly think of Joshua, the sixth book of the Bible, the successor of Moses, Joshua, son of Nun. Joshua, son of Mary, and Joshua, son of Nun, are linked in their vocation. And we will discover more about that as we read through the book of Mark. And we move on. It is the beginning of good news of Jesus, and he has two titles. I must say sometimes when I meet very simple Christians, I need to explain that when we say Jesus Christ, we don't mean Jesus, the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ. We need to explain that Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, and even that might not be fully understood, because in the Old Testament, Messiah which is not a very common word, is used to refer to the anointed one. But I do want to point out that Messiah in the Old Testament does not mean most of the time 
some eschatological end of time figure. No, it means an anointed one who has been anointed with oil or with the spirit of God to fulfill a very important function in the life of the people. The anointed one is a mediator, a mediator between God and the people. And in fact, we can identify three different types of anointed ones, three different kinds of mediators. And so let's look at the verses. I've chosen a few. Again, the word Messiah appears almost 50 times in the Old Testament, not a lot. But here are some of the times. <laughs> Excuse me. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 3 is the first time it appears in our Bible. And the Messiah, the Christos, the anointed one, is the priest who brings an offering for sin. Let's read one of the times in chapter 4 that the word is used. If it is <coughs> the anointed priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people, he shall offer for the sin that he has committed a bull of the herd without blemish as a sin offering to the Lord. Very interesting. The first Messiah mentioned in the Old Testament is one who offers a sin offering. But then in 1 Samuel 16, 13, and in many other places in the historical books, the anointed one is not a priest, but a king. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed the verb, him, in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. David here is the Messiah, the anointed one, because he is the king anointed with holy oil, just as the priest is anointed with holy oil. Again, the first mediator, Messiah, anointed one, is a priest. But here it is a king. And then we have a very surprising verse. By the way, the only time that this word Messiah is used in the book of Isaiah. We often seem to think that Isaiah speaks all the time about Messiah. But this is the only time he uses the, ver the word. And what is the verse? Thus says the Lord to his Messiah, to his anointed one, to his Christos. And who is it? It's Cyrus. And by now you will already know that Cyrus is a central figure in the history of the people of Israel because this anointed king, this Cyrus, this Gentile king, this king of the Persians is the one who opens the tomb so that Israel can exit from exile. And Cyrus says to the people, go to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Cyrus, the Messiah. David and the kings after him, messiahs. These are the kings and the priests. And I'm sure all of you know now where I'm going. The third mediating figure who is not anointed with oil, but anointed with the spirit of God is the prophet. And we go back to the text that we already read, Isaiah 61.1. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Yes, the same word. That prophet anointed by the spirit is also a Messiah. He has sent me to be a herald of good news to the oppressed. Three types of mediators. I might add that there is a fourth mediator, very important, who is never referred to as anointed, and that is the sage. But that's also a discussion for another day. There is one book where we find an eschatological Messiah. It's a very late book in the Old Testament, a very important book that Jesus refers to often. And that is the book of Daniel, written in around 160, 65, 70, around that period. And in Daniel 9.25, one of the mentions in that chapter of the word Messiah, we have the following. Know therefore and understand 
from the time that the word went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the time of an anointed prince. This is a very difficult text to understand, but I'm bringing it because, yes, in the Old Testament, a very few times, only two or three times, the Messiah refers to a figure who will come at the end of time, a redeeming, salvific figure. And finally, we come to the last part of the title. I repeat it so that we are not getting lost. The title is Beginning of Good News of Jesus, who is Christ and Son of God. Now, again, the bells should be ringing, for we have a Son of God in the Old Testament. The Son of God in the Old Testament is most often the people of Israel. The people of Israel is the firstborn Son of God. By the life of Israel, the life they are supposed to lead, the life of fidelity to the word of God, to the Torah of God, that life is supposed to attract all the other children, the nations who will come to Jerusalem to learn the Torah from God's firstborn son. Notice I'm deliberately using language that for us as Christians is so significant because Jesus for us is the son of God. I'd like to read two verses from the Old Testament that drive home the use of this expression son when it refers to the people of Israel. And the first time explicitly, it is in Exodus chapter four, verse 22. Moses is in front of the burning bush. God is sending Moses to Pharaoh to tell Pharaoh to let the people go. And this is what's written there. Then you, Moses, shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. The exact expression that is used later by Luke ah, when he calls Jesus also the firstborn son of Mary. And not only there, but in a verse that is used by Matthew in chapter 2 of Matthew, Hosea 11.1. 1. Hosea, one of the great ancient prophets of Israel from the 8th century, writes, When Israel was a child, I, God, loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The son of God in the Old Testament is Israel, the people. Now you'll understand that when I say that the center of Israel's experience is death and resurrection, death of the son and resurrection of the son, what I'm referring to is the Babylonian exile as death and Cyrus, the king of the Persians, conquering Babylon and opening the tomb, allowing the people the Son of God, to return to Jerusalem and rebuild Jerusalem. Once again, remember, Mark is a first century Jew. He knows these scriptures very well. And even more important, this is the language of Jesus, the discourse of the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, the scriptures of Israel. I've added one more verse because it's a very interesting verse and reminds us of something absolutely central. Israel was, and listen to the expression carefully because it's very confusing, Israel is the second firstborn son of God. It's not the first time that God has tried to have a son. For in fact, as Luke tells us in chapter 3, verse 38, it's the end of the long genealogy of Jesus, a genealogy that is inserted after the baptism in Luke and before the temptation. He gives us the genealogy of Jesus that begins, Jesus was about 30 years old, son of Joseph. And it goes all the way back to the end of the genealogy, which is in fact the beginning, 
the son of Enosh, the son of Shet, the son of Adam. Notice the son of God. Now, how did Luke get to this expression, Adam, son of God? And I will say it's a very good reading of the creation story. Listen closely. Indeed, Adam is created in the image and likeness of God. Walking down the street one day in Johannesburg with my late father, we met a friend of his and I had been away for decades. This friend had never seen me before, but took one look at me and turned to my father and said, this must be your son. He is your image and likeness. Yes, being created in the image and likeness is to be a son. Not only that, but God takes care of Adam as only a father would, providing him with everything that he needs. And then, most significantly in the Old Testament, God looks at his son and says, it's not good that my son is alone. And he goes out to look for a wife for his son, typically father behavior. And in chapter five of Genesis, what signifies the father in the Old Testament is that the father names the son. And in chapter five, verse two, it's written, and God named Adam, Adam, and Adam named Seth, Seth, and so forth. Remember again, Joseph is told to name Jesus, and in that becomes Jesus' father. Now, I have probably gone into more detail that you might want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here. This is what we're going to be doing, okay? Over the next weeks, we have done one verse. I'm hoping that we will be at this pace all through our study together to really appreciate this wonderful book, to really appreciate Mark's writing, to display how he carefully chose words and these words that we understand literally as we must evoke echoes of the entire scripture of the people of Israel, giving these words a depth that we miss if we don't know the scriptures of Israel. And so I stopped the sharing. Again, it might take me a few minutes to get this right. I'm going to stop. And now mm, I have to shut down this. Okay, close it. Open up this, and I hope you can see me now. Ursula, can you give me feedback that I'm visible? Yes, great. So um, I see that we have a lot of participants and I'm going to ask Ursula if she can help me with the chat and perhaps channel questions if there are any. It looks like there aren't any, so Perhaps if you do want to ask a question, make a comment, make a critique, tell me that I'm wrong, please feel, feel free. Um, we can have a last part of our time together, the last 15 minutes, in talking about what we've discussed. Of course, I would prefer that it would be talking about what we've discussed and not asking me what I ate for breakfast or ask me about Shakespeare, but rather that we focus on are the Gospel of Mark, and perhaps even better, what we've just heard. Of course, if there's no questions, I know that Ursula will have many. Okay, so we can start, and this question I can see. Will you talk at a later stage? Oops, it went because a new question came. Wonderful, please send them in. Ursula, would you be able to read the question so that... You so the first to, question yeah. is... Um... Will you talk at a later stage again about Mark uh, as a disciple of Paul? Absolutely. I'm not sure whether it will be next week or the week after, but I will definitely talk a lot. And by the way, I'll already give a little hint 
that I believe that G the icon that Mark is painting of Jesus is firmly founded on Paul's canonic theology. Now, I'll explain what I mean by canonic. Kenosis is the word that Mark uses in Philippians 2 to describe Jesus divesting himself of all divinity and becoming one of us, going down from the heights of divinity to our situation as humans and going even lower to be a slave and even lower to die on the cross. This is the central mystery that Mark is struggling with. How could God, the son of God, die on the cross? And this is at the center of Paul's theology and at the center of Mark's narration. So we will come back to that time and again. Then there's uh, two more questions about um, the relationship with, Mar with uh, Paul. The first is from Theo, why is it controversial that Mark is an associate of Paul? And then Keith <laughs> says, I've always thought that Mark was a disciple of Peter. Whereas you've so mentioned- So Keith has answered the question that was asked by, who asked the first question? Um, Theo. Theo. Yeah. So Keith, you jumped in and said, yes, that is a first reason. Tradition, tradition claims, that Mark was an, a, a companion of Peter and that his version of the events, as we know, according to tradition again, ah, this is tradition, Mark did not know Jesus directly. Two of the evangelists did not know Jesus directly, Mark and Luke. According to tradition, Mark is a disciple of Peter and Luke is a disciple of Paul. So that's the first reason why it might be a little controversial. A second reason is that Mark does not always use in what I would call his Pauline theology, a vocabulary that is identifiably Pauline. I will claim that Mark is a writer in his own right and that he has assimilated Pauline theology and is sharing his own rendition of that theology. When we come to moments <laughs> where I feel that the kenosis is being described, I'll point it out. And it already happens in chapter one, so you won't have to wait too long. Okay, so I hope that answers the both questions about why is it controversial that Mark is a disciple of Paul? And yes, tradition claims he's a disciple of Peter. Just a word, ah, a word, and I hope I'm not being too Jesuitical and that you will be scandalized. We do not know who wrote the four books of the gospel. No, not one of the books names the author, okay? The names that were attributed and the traditions that developed around those names are the product of the end of the second century. Particularly the great theologian, Saint Irenaeus of Lyon is the first to mention that there are four books, okay? Four authoritative books of the gospel. And he gives them the names that we have today uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So again, we don't quite know who wrote this book, but I have no problem calling it the Gospel of Mark and trying to understand who Mark is through what he writes. Um, Debbie says, please could you elaborate on who Cyrus was and his role in liberating Israel? Absolutely. Okay, so Cyrus, we know Cyrus both from world history and from the texts of the Bible. So Cyrus appears a number, of, <clears throat> a number of times in the texts of the Bible, most significantly in the book of Isaiah, as I pointed out, chapter 45, verse one, he's mentioned there as the anointed one of God. Very surprising, he's a Gentile king. And in order to understand why, <coughs> We can open the end of the book of Second Chronicles, and the text there is repeated at the beginning of Ezra. And there it tells us that in around the year, the year is not mentioned because we count the years according to BC and AD, 
but what it would correspond to is around the year 540 or 539 BC, Cyrus, the king of the Persians, captured Babylon. The Babylonians had destroyed Jerusalem and sent the elite into exile. Cyrus captures Babylon and initiates a policy that we know not only from the Bible, but from exterior sources as well. He established a policy whereby exiled peoples were allowed to return to their homeland. And so Cyrus is at the origin of the return of an elite to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, what we call the second temple, and reinitiate life in the land. It was not independent, the little province that was established. It was called Yehud. And by the way, from this time, we have the word Yehudim, translated as Jews, only from after the exile. And so Cyrus is a very central figure and is recognized as such in the Bible. Of course, we have a very strange situation where God is speaking to a Gentile king. It's not unique in the Bible, but of course, that's the biblical rendition of what seems to be a historical fact that Cyrus allowed the exiles to go back to Jerusalem. Hmm. The next question, um, in Genesis, we read God was the beginning. God was in the beginning. But in the text you referred to regarding wisdom, we read that God created wisdom. Can we say that there is a time element introduced here by wisdom creation? Uh, do you see wisdom as a figure of Jesus? <laughs> okay, again, a very complex question, and I can only answer on one foot. But one of the very interesting texts is the text I refer to, Proverbs 8, 22 to 31, where wisdom is uh, humanized, okay? Wisdom appears as a figure, not as a phenomenon, not as a gift of God, but as a figure. And in that text, wisdom is created and is God's companion as God creates the world. Again, I recommend strongly you, use, uh, you read the text. It's very inspiring for John, okay? John, who calls Jesus the word. OK, and the word is a later development on Sophia. Sophia is the personification of wisdom. So Proverbs begins this. It's a late text, probably from the Persian or even the Greek period. Again, who wrote that particular part of Proverbs? And the text is further developed in the Book of Wisdom of Solomon, which is a first century BC Greek writing, where Solomon, who in the history books is remembered for his stupidity in wanting to marry too many women, in wanting too much money, in wanting too many horses, and not relying on God. In Wisdom of Solomon, Solomon wants the perfect wife, the one who will be his helpmeet, who will help him rule. And so he seeks out Sophia. Of course, this is a kind of metaphor for the wise king who knows that he can only rule with wisdom. A beautiful text at the end of Proverbs, which I particularly love and which Jews sing at their dinner on Friday night, very often to the mother of the family. It comes right at the end in chapter 31 of Proverbs is called the valorous woman. Okay, we often translate it as the woman of virtue, but it's not virtue. It's strength. Uh, the Hebrew word is hail. Hail is strength, power. She is the powerhouse. In fact, her husband does nothing. She does everything. He does only one thing. He sits at the gates of the city and boasts about his wife, while she is not only running the household, but she is doing everything. Commerce, uh, producing. And again, it's the image of wisdom, wisdom as the woman. And it's a wonderful offset to the more negative image that we might have from Christian tradition based on the figure of Eve, who is redeemed by Mary. So do I see this as a image of Jesus? Well, it's not that I see it as an image of Jesus. John will develop that in his whole 
logo theology, uh, the logos, which is preceded by the image, the personification of wisdom. Um, Don asks, on what source or sources of literature is Mark's book based? And oh. Keith responds, I'm going to just say it, is that it's generally accepted that Mark's gospel was written first. I understood that Mark had written an original document on which Matthew based his gospel. Thereafter, Mark wrote the text we now know as his version of the gospel. Okay, so that's the same very speculative. Or... Okay, very speculative. There is incredible speculation okay, about all of this, but I'll refer only to the sources of Mark and say with enormous simplicity, I don't know. And when I say I don't know, I don't think that anyone knows with any certainty. Remember that the discipline of historical critical research engage, engages in a lot of speculation, but we don't really know. What can we assume, and I'll repeat what I said earlier, we can assume three stages in the development of the New Testament. The first stage is a historical Jesus of Nazareth who went around preaching. What do we know about him? <clears throat> Not much, but I do strongly recommend the works of a wonderful United States exegete, <coughs> I can almost say he's a Jesuit because Benedict the 16th in Jesus of Nazareth called him a Jesuit, but he's not, okay? He's a diocesan priest who spent his life engaged in historical research on Jesus, and his name is Meyer, John Meyer, M-E-I-E-R. Now, I just said something very weird when you look at Meyer's work. I said, we know very little about the historical Jesus. But out of the little that we know, Maya produced five huge volumes, and they are absolutely wonderful. I strongly recommend reading them, where Maya investigates the first century in order to describe the life of a marginal Jew. We know that Jesus didn't come from the center. He was not from Jerusalem. He came from this nowhere that Mark calls Nazareth. We'll come to that next time or the time after or in three weeks, depending how fast we go. But Nazareth is a mystery in the Gospel of Mark. So again, ah, that is the first period. The second period, and again, we assume this, is that once the disciples had experienced Jesus' resurrection, they went out to preach. And so Jesus the preacher became Jesus the preached. Now, it's very sad. I'm sure you all know about this. But there was a terrible fire that destroyed the library that contained all of the videos that were taken of Jesus the preacher and Jesus the preached. The poor photographers who were following them around and filming every moment and recording every word, it's all lost, it's gone. It's nothing, okay, I'm joking. But we need to come to terms with the fact that we don't have any uh, clear, archaeological resources to draw on when we're trying to reconstruct Jesus the preacher or Jesus the preached. It's speculation, and some of it very educated speculation, but nonetheless, it's always to some degree of probability and not the truth. But, but what we do have is Jesus the written, okay? Jesus the written, and again, as far as we know, this is we know, it begins with Paul. Paul writing the first epistle to the Thessalonians dealing with existential crises of people who believe in Jesus in the year 5051. And again, I say, I believe that Mark bases himself a lot on Pauline theology. Where does the narrative come from? Well, we can assume that Mark has heard. He has heard the stories transmitted. And I'm going to say again something that not everyone agrees with, but which I think, and that is that the Gospel of Mark is written shortly after the destruction of Jerusalem. It was after the destruction of Jerusalem that the disciples of Jesus realized the center is lost. The first witnesses are dying. We need a source to talk about Jesus. We need a discourse. We need a narrative. 
And so the writing process begins of writing the story of Jesus. First Mark, then Matthew, then Luke, then John. Okay, those are the authoritative versions. I can't say much more than that. Ursula, I see it's eight o'clock. I know that when I attend Zoom, I get very frustrated when the Zoom goes on and on. I can suggest, Ursula, I'm taking yeah. the authority. You are the authority, so if you don't agree, whoever would like to leave can leave at this point. Those who have asked questions and would like their questions to be answered, we can perhaps take another five minutes. But I don't want any, anybody to feel bad about leaving now because the time's up. Okay, so David, Ursula, if you want to see the other questions, then. David, there are no more questions. So, oh, okay, um, wonderful. I so, think we can. Really? What, we can sync, end. what synchronized time? Yes. So thank so, you very um, much for your uh, for your attention and with Ursula's per per uh, permission and the permission of the Jesuit Institute, we will meet again next Tuesday and perhaps do instead of one verse, two verses next Tuesday will be ambitious. Wonderful. Thank you very much, David. That was an awesome presentation and really, really wonderful to hear you and we look forward to next week and thank you everybody for joining us. Have a good evening.